We have, we have Mommy Akria here, we have Kelly here, we have Rosebud here, and I think we can start. It's six o'clock. Um, Bessie will be joining us, I think, in about five minutes because she's engaged in a meeting. So we welcome you once again to this second episode of our interactions with our female lawyers as they take us through the journey of their expectations and their realities when they started the law. I know a section of um, our speakers have their training in the United Kingdom. Some also had their training in Ghana. Some are corporate lawyers, some are, uh, litigation lawyers. Some also have families and then others are single. So we'll be exploring all these, um, all these diverse areas as they also let us know the challenges as they face as women and other perspective that the cropping law firms are now engaging more women than men um, as a form of affirmative action. We ask them of the opinion to find out um, how they also think about it, whether it's true or it's just affection being spread out in the general uh, working space. So let me start. I can see um, Mame. Yes. I mean, let's start straight from you. Um, I know last week you introduced yourself and we have new speakers, but uh, zooming straight into action, I want to know whether law was your first choice um, course or you did something before you, you veered into law. Um, so law was always the, the, the end result for me. I think when I was much younger, I looked into journalism um, but then I realized that the things that attracted me to journalism were also the skills that I would have needed to become a lawyer and so for me law was very early on the cards, on the cards um, in terms of my career. Okay so Kelly, Kelly can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right. So was law your, your first choice course or probably did something before you get into the area of law? Yes, um, law was not my first choice at all. I had wanted to go into dentistry and my first degree was actually in the biological basis of behavior, which is sort of like neuroscience. Oh. And um, it was after that that um, it sort of just hit me that I didn't want to actually do that. And it was maybe sort of society's expectations of me because I was good at science. And um, I just decided to go into law and yeah. Okay, um, let's hear from Rosebud. Rosebud, was law your first degree or you did something before? No, um, law, law is my first degree. I don't have any other degree so okay yeah. so you always wanted to be a lawyer from yeah okay. yeah I did I did and thankfully at the time that I was um, going into the university you could actually go to tech and get the LLB because initially you needed to um, have a first degree before you could go to Ligon and then tech started offering the LLB as an undergraduate course. So um, I was able to do that in tech. Yeah. Okay, okay. I don't know whether Bessie has joined us. If Bessie is not here, then we just move straight into the next phase. Um, I mean, I, I know you did the UK law and then also came to, I mean, in Ghana, did the um, professional course. Um, take us to the journey from the UK to Ghana, why did you decide to come to Ghana to pursue the law degree? Um, so that's a very interesting question. Um, the decision to go to law school in Ghana wasn't so much of a career or it wasn't a planned thing. It was more circumstances that uh, brought me to Ghana. 
And um, when I realized that I was actually going to be in Ghana for the long term, I decided to, you know, the only way that I could practice uh, legally <laughs> was by going to law school here as well. So, um, funnily enough, I think I was a little bit misinformed. And I say this because um, a lot of the stuff that I was working on, which were largely cor corporate, you know, transactional work, let me say, um, I genuinely believe that I could have still done it without having gone to um, Ghana Law School, because a lot of the things that were taught in Ghana Law School are not really um, steered in the direction of people that practice transactional work. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I don't know if I was misinformed or if I just assumed that I would have a better understanding or it would guide me in some way um, in terms of what I was doing already. Uh, I think for solicitors that are qualified in the UK, there is a lot of benefit because you, you learn a lot of things that you are not taught as a solicitor, but um, yeah, so I, it, I believe that I had to go to Ghana Law School in order to further my career in Ghana, I would say. Okay, I mean, for, for Ghana Law School, you know that once you don't have the the PL in Ghana. The only way you can have it once, if, even if you've had the LOD elsewhere, is to just get a practicing license and it's just a requirement. And then also to introduce you to the general Ghanaian legal framework before you get to it. But I understand you. I know now currently you are even working on foreign international transactions, so you don't really. Exactly. exactly. So I find that my training in the UK is far more relevant to the things that I do every day than the training that I had in Ghana in terms of um, going to the law school. Okay, Kelly, I know you were mates with Mami Um what, what brought you to Ghana? Was it to enter into full time litigation or probably come home? and then make a contribution to the development of your lovely mother nation? Um, so I, even though I was living outside <laughs> Ghana for some time, I always knew I wanted to move back to Ghana. And um, it was for that reason, I actually went to law school in England because the system is so much more similar to the Ghanaian system. And um, unlike mommy, I did the BPTC, which is the English bar, as opposed to the solicitor's training program. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess coming to Ghana was really just because it's home. I'm, I'm, I can't lie. I wasn't coming back to help my country. <laughs> 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 I was just coming because it's the place I want to live in, country I want to live in. Oh, but in other ways, I'm sure that um, the expertise knowledge I learned in the UK, you are contributing professionally to the development of the legal profession in the area that you find yourself. So, um, okay, I, I, I believe that you are still contributing your quota. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but take us through the transition. How, how, how was it transitioning from the UK practice straight to the Ghanaian practice? Was it, was it a sharp difference or it was a smooth journey? Well, I didn't practice in England. Okay. Okay. Yes, but I think that the transition was even even without practicing, it wasn't that easy because I think um, the way the courts work here, then in theory they're similar, but in practice not really. Um, and I can give you an example. Um, I marshaled with a circuit court judge in England, which is. Um, Marshalling is you basically sit with them during their cases, you talk to them for a period of time. So it's almost like shadowing or interning with the judge. And um, within a week, we did a full trial. The witnesses gave evidence for about five hours every day. When everything was said and done, we went into chambers, he, we discussed this a bit and he wrote his judgment and delivered it that same day. And in practice here, I mean, you get at best an hour a day and you'll do that for maybe 
10 sessions over two years or something like that. Okay. And I mean, sometimes in the commercial courts is a little better. You might get two weeks where you come every day, but only for an hour. And really, if you were able to have three, four days, four hours every day, you could probably finish the trial, but the system just isn't set up that way. And so you have cases taking much, much longer than they should. And so that aspect of litigation is something I really had to adjust or adjust my expectations for because I really didn't, I knew litigation takes time. You have to be patient, but not that much time. <laughs> okay, and um, Rosebud, I know you, you do more corporate than litigation. What, 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 why do you choose corporate law? Um, I think Is Kelly, I, I think Kelly. Other? Okay. No, I think, I think Kelly just, you know, <laughs> gave my reason because it just took, it took too much time. You know, when I um, started my pupillage, I actually was really into um, dispute resolution and go to court all the time. And, you know, I was fascinated by it. And just before I even got to that point, Mamika had spoken about how um, the Ghana School of Law sort of curriculum is it's more geared towards litigation and I find I find that to be very true because you know I feel like generally in, in Ghana when you say you're a lawyer everybody thinks of courts like hey let me get a case and take you to court you know the, co the commercial and corporate aspect of law is, is somewhat hidden and if you if you're a lawyer and you've never been to court people will not even sort of give you any respect because how can you be a lawyer I've never been to court yeah, but they, there's so they tell you that um how can, you're not a lawyer yeah yeah you're yeah, not a lawyer but box, there's box. so many you know aspects of the law and I think that with even with our legal education you can tell that it's so get it, it assumes that everybody will be into litigation and so we just sort of are taught that way so I think for me starting my practice it was also a little difficult and I realized that I was I didn't really want to do the litigation as much because then I was struggling with certain things that maybe other um, colleagues of mine who have had education in other jurisdictions uh, you know have a better um, um, hold of like let's say contract drafting or review or just things things like that but when I started my pupillage and I started getting to litigation it, I mean you could be in court all day first of all they are calling the cases according to seniority so yeah I mean like when will I be called unless I'm with my senior you know and how many times will or your, will you go with your senior? Because, you know, usually you know how it is. Your junior, you have to go by yourself. Yeah. You'll be in court all day. And at the, at the time, the firm I was at was... You'll be in court all day just to take an adjournment. Sometimes you oh, enter the debate. Oh, you, you oh sometimes, sometimes a lawyer on the other side won't even come. So, I mean, all sorts of sh shenanigans. And I mean, then at the time, the firm I was at was also pretty small. So you had to do both dispute resolution and corporate work. And so you, after you're done, you have to come back and now come and work on your transaction. It was just too hectic. And so I had to just decide that, you, you know, this litigation, I don't have the patience. I think Alice said, I don't have the patience for it. Even now, every time I have to go to court, I literally drag myself because I have to do it just because I'm required. But if I had a choice, it's too much work. It's, 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 a, lot of, it's a lot of work for me but yeah that's that's how I got into and I, I love the corporate practice I, I can sit behind my desk and behind my computer for hours and I don't get bored of it so I think it was an easy decision for me all right I know you you, you are a corporate uh, one of the finest corporate lawyers that we can get on ah, <laughs> So um, tell us about the journey into corporate law. Did you start off as a corporate lawyer in the UK or even in Ghana when you started? Were you a corporate so, lawyer? Um, I mean, I'll take it from when I when I started working in Ghana. Before I went to uh, Makola, as it were, I was actually with a firm. Um, I had worked um, in a corporate in, in a like for a financial institution, um, and then I went into a firm because I didn't actually have a lot of experience working in private practice as we call it 
Um, and so, and knowing that I was going to Makola, I felt like I needed that experience of going to court and doing litigation because I was very green in that field. Um, so when I, you know, when I worked with the firm, um, fortunately, we had a, a bit of booth, as Rosebud was saying, we're doing both corporate sort of work and, or I'll say booth listing and barrister type work. So um, I knew very early that uh, being a barrister, um, although I enjoyed advocacy very much, and I will say that I feel handling litigation or being a barrister, um, you learn a lot every day. There, there's so many parts of the law that you get to learn when you are um, working on cases, but it just didn't fit my personality in a sense that, um, you know, I really did enjoy the transactional stuff and the, it, I found that a little bit more engaging. And I also found it harder to quantify uh, my work in terms of litigation, like how do you get remuneration when you're working on a case for, for two years? The, the, the concept till today, just, I, I just still don't understand it. So I have to say that a lot of my motivation to go in in-house had to do with, um, or, or steering more towards transactional work had to do with financials as well. Um, and so after working with the firm and then going into Makola, um, you know, after I got called, I, I worked with the firm for a little while and then I just wanted to fully go in-house. Okay, I know the, the last one standing on this platform, in litigation is Kelly, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. So Kelly, um, it's two against one now. Um, <laughs> what, what, what is your motivation in still being the last woman standing when mommy and then Rosebud prefers to do copy law? Um, I think it's just to me, it's way more engaging. Um, the advocacy aspect, and then also it's rewarding in the sense of, in the sense that you're helping people. So in my chambers, we do a very, very wide range of cases. Um, sometimes I'm in the district court doing a divorce. Sometimes I'm in the commercial courts doing um, a trial with three or four different corporations who are all fighting over some money. Um, and that you get different things from each of them. So in, in, with, with the smaller cases, with person to person, um, it's really, really rewarding to see that smile on someone's face when you help them. And then with the bigger transactions, those are also, those are great because you don't have to, even though I said I like helping people, it's also nice to not deal with the people sometimes and just deal with the law because with those more complex cases, you're really engaging with the law. And so I also really like that. Um, and also, I, I don't really like transactional work. I've done a bit of this, and I actually still do a lot of it because it's quick money, and I'm in a chamber, so I'm allowed to have my own cases and all of that. But um, honestly, I just don't find that very rewarding. Um, yeah, contract drafting, I'll do it because, yeah, everyone likes money. But um, <laughs> it's, it's just me, it's boring. Mm. Mm. Okay, for that boring aspect, I'll, I'll speak to Mamie Kriya about it. Um, Bessie, Bessie, welcome to the Lawyer's Diary. You are the last person Thank we're waiting you. for. All Thank right, you. so I know you're also into litigation, like Kelly, right? No, I'm more into the corporates and transactional. Okay, okay. So it's very, very against uh, just Kelly. <laughs> what, 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 what informed your decision to um, go into uh, corporate law at an early stage of your professional career? Okay, so um, I've not decided solely to do corporate or transactional learning. I'm still exploring because these are the formative years of my career. So I'm still in the quest to find what I am actually very interested in. But I think with what I do, it's not solely 
corporate and transactional. We do a lot of op opinions and and it cuts across all areas of law, family law, there's employment law, there's so much, not just limited to corporate and transactional law. And so since it's a firm that does a lot of things, I'm still, I don't think I will go solely into corporate and transactional. I will do a mixed breed of everything. So yeah. All right, so Kelly mentioned something which I want the corporate lawyers to clarify. Kelly uh, sees corporate law to be a bit boring as compared to the everyday um, courts, different cases, doing different sort of things. I know that, Mami Epi, aside you doing transactional law, you also um, do a bit of community relations, you do finance work, you work on policies, and stuff. So if there's a lawyer out there who wants to also start off with corporate law, what, what is there to tell that lawyer? From my um, perspective, is corporate law boring? From my, from my perspective, I find it very, very exciting. Um, the most exciting part for me about law is the language, right? And I know this is probably going to sound a little bit nerdy, but nothing makes me happier than being able to come up with a word that um, captures what the client wants or that's able to protect the client or you know being reading through an agreement and knowing that I've saved the, the client some money. Um, so that's with the transactional side of it. Like because I enjoy words and words, wordplay, linguistics, those kinds of things, I really find it very thrilling. I get excited when I have like a new project that requires both research and reading and all that kind of stuff. So that's that side of it. For some people, that that part may not be so exciting. Um, the other aspect of it is being in-house um, you're like the central nervous system of the company so you deal with all the departments um, and I know on this so it's like your uh, 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 in, in, our, in our case in particular it's like you're mother, mothering a child when we're working on a project and just making sure that they're doing the things that they have to do because we do a lot of compliance as well we have agreements that they have to stick to we have rules that they have to follow and sometimes we're trying to circumvent stuff and sometimes we're trying to read in between the lines and sometimes we're trying to see how we can make the law play on our side so for, for me I find it so 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 exciting I think um, depending on what your interests are um, you know corporate can be very very rewarding and and I, I don't find it boring at all as as Kelly said but I, I, I think for, for younger people or people who are entering into the law, you have to understand your personality. And it's, it's not wise to do one thing or the other because of somebody else's experience. You know, it, you, your personality plays a big role. Um, and I like that Bessie said she was still sort of navigating to see what would work for her. And I think that's very important. Um, I know people that start off doing corporate and end up um back in private practice although that way around is much harder and a lot more people start in private practice and end up in corporate so you just have to see what works for you okay um well i'd like to say that because you in particular you do a lot of things in terms of not like a banking or say a commission where it gets to be a repeated action that's why you're given a different perspective other than somebody who say is booked up in a bank or is booked up in a commission where every day you get to just review um, loan agreement, guarantee, registration of these and it's a repeated I, mean, I, I, I think even with those, and perhaps I could be wrong, but even with the, the lawyers that I know that work in banks, they are quite exciting. I mean, the, the agreements may be the same, you know, um, in form, but in substance, you have to take into account the, the background behind the agreement, the personalities, the different things that the people want. Um, and I don't know if I'm being, you know, I'm romanticizing it here, but I, I think it can be quite exciting. <laughs> Very exciting. Now, let me move to Rosebud. Rosebud, 
you have been a corporate. Hello, Rosbad. Hi, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. So um, I know you're a corporate lawyer, as you explained. Take us through uh, some of the challenges of being a corporate lawyer, especially a female corporate lawyer in an institution or a firm. Okay, thank you. So, um, um, so I work at a law firm. So I, I, I have a sort of a, my experience a little different from Mamika who's in, in house. Um, I think for me in, initially, one of the first, I wouldn't say it was a challenge, but one of the first coincidences I had was that all the law firms that I've worked in so far have been mainly female dominated. The first law firm that I worked at in Dona, um, I think there were only women until probably right about the time I was leaving when we had one or two other guys. Um, I think that that was a little challenging, not because it was solely women, but just because you miss out on the diversity of having you know, men around and having that different perspective also. And just also for business development sometimes you know, people want to see that the firm is, is um, diverse. Um, so that's just from a sort of firm perspective. But um, individually, I would say that it was a little challenging just getting used to the working hours in the beginning. You know, um, I'm sure that most of us, know, I, I don't think it's something that is specific to being transactional or corporate, but I think generally the working hours can be brutal and, you know, having to work every day back then till midnight or 1 p.m., especially as a young lawyer, a female lawyer, it was a little scary, but I mean, these are things that um, as time goes on, you sort of um, get used to. The one thing that I would say I haven't really enjoyed is the fact that sometimes what I have found, especially with our clients or some clients, is that when you're a woman, they, I don't know, I want to be able to say this in the most diplomatic way as possible, but you're almost sort of like seen as more an admin person than as a lawyer. Sometimes, you know, sometimes, especially if there is another, let's say a male lawyer in the room. And I found that in the beginning, it, it, it's, it's been, sometimes you can go for a meeting and I mean, you are there to, you know, probably negotiate a deal or handle some transaction and, you know, someone will be ordering you around and go and make some tea, go and do this, go and do that. And you are just wondering, hey, what's happening here? You know, and um, it was a little, these are things that sometimes, especially because of our um, culture and the way we are brought up, it's also very sensitive and you have to be careful with the way you respond. Um, but I think sort of navigating those things for me personally have been difficult, just trying to deal with a lot of our, um, the clients because sometimes most of the clients that I've had to deal with are men. And so half of the time, some of them are flirting with you. Half of the time, some of them are not able to really hold boundaries and know how to speak with you and treat you with a respect as a lawyer and someone that's actually bringing value to the transaction. Other times, you know, it, so it's, it's, it's been a, whole, a mix of different, different things, but these are the things I can think of right, 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 right now. All right, so you've given us that perspective of um, a, a lawyer working in a firm, a female lawyer working in a firm. Now, um, Bessie, I know you just completed your pupillage. Uh, so during your pupillage, what are some of the problems or challenges that you face as a female lawyer in a law firm as a junior? Okay, thank you. So um, to begin with, just like it was bad, my firm is also very women oriented like there's a lot there are a lot of it's dominated by a lot of women so I was coming from a place like you are used to um, a balance of gender everywhere and then you just come and you have to find how to deal with just women emotionally and find how to be able to cooperate with them without stepping on any toes so um, it's been very smooth um, it's, it's been very smoother than I expected because I thought, you know how women can behave, but 
it's it's better here. I mean, if you know the facts that you are there to learn, you are able to control to a number of things. Not that you are being a sheep, but then you are humble and then still making sure that you are learning the best that you you can. So, with respect to challenges, I've not really experienced so many. Um, it's just a lot of communication issues, but those have been addressed along the way, generally. So that's been my experience so far. Truthfully, yes, I've not had any challenges <laughs> so I hope, far. I hope, I hope you are not hope... going back because it's a conversation. Oh, not at all. All right, all right. Okay, Honestly, then, uh, that's the truth. Very that's the truth. <laughs> now, Kelly, 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 Kelly is the only litigation lawyer here. So give us the perspective of a litigation lawyer, female litigation lawyer, um, some of the challenges that you face well, okay, so unlike the rest of them, I'm in a very male-centric world. Um, I think what I've noticed is when we started, when I started pupillage and um, going to court, there were lots of women who I kind of recognized from being called around the same time I was. Um, a year in, maybe half the number, two years in, like 10 of them. Um, <laughs> now, I don't even think that there's like one person I recognize. Um, and my chambers is full of men. Um, there was one lady, she left. Luckily, another one joined now. Um, in the work environment, everyone is very professional, um, well, all my colleagues are very professional, um, but similar to what Bessie said, you have um, people coming in all the time who think you're the secretary or, I don't know, and in, no, they, they never think you're even an intern. It's like, and you know, the interesting thing, a lot of times there's women who make those assumptions about you. So someone came in and there were two of us, we were dressed very much like lawyers. I think we were even wearing our collarettes at the time. And she said, oh, are you the secretaries? Or some, something to that effect. And we were like, no. And then she said it again. She said, oh, no. The, then she said, oh, are you the clerks? Or something like that. I was like, no, we're not. We're, why? She, she made about three guesses as to our roles before we finally had to say, no, we are lawyers. Like, women can be lawyers. And... um clients male clients as well hitting on you that happens all the time um usually it's like you can just laugh it off and just move on um i've never had an experience where it was so uncomfortable but most of the time you just move on and i think like in the in the litigation world as well when you, you're doing land cases and stuff some of the clients are um I don't know what to say. Um, they're a little more raw, let me put it that way. So I've had a client who I walked past him in the in the waiting room and he made a comment about my butt. And I was very surprised. I was taken aback. I didn't know what to do. I, I was like, okay. Um, so you have to try and find a way to navigate all those things because like Rosebud said, you once you you even take offenses like oh you and you are so sensitive oh um they'll say us like in Ghana they would say oh if no no like I don't know if you guys understand what that means but and you'd be like no I actually didn't overreact where you're in my law office why would you make a comment about my body um so those are some of the things sometimes you have to deal with um but you just Unfortunately, a lot of times you just have to kind of ignore it. Um, one thing that I do wish I had was older females and my older female lawyers in my life. I don't, I don't think I'm close to a single, um, I don't think I have a mentor who's a woman. I don't think I have a single like um, older lady who I could call and discuss any legal issues with or any professional issues with. All my mentors are men. Um, yeah, it's it's a very male centric world I'm in. So, so I wish I wish I could get around that sometimes, but yeah. All right, Kelly. I mean, there are there are some notions out that even in terms of giving out 
work within the law firm. Say a client works to the law firm. Most of the seniors prefer giving work to the male rather than the female, even though you may be at the same level. I don't know whether it's, it may not be you, probably some of your friends and other stuff. Is it something that you've heard? Is it something that is happening? Or is it just um, a mere um, allegations being made against some senior members or partners of, of a law firm? Um, I have not experienced that, but I, do, I, do, I wouldn't want to take away from anyone's experience. So I can imagine it happening, but my chambers is it's even though it's very male centric, I think that in terms of the senior members, they they're very very fair, and I'm also quite assertive, and so I don't think I've ever really encountered an, um, a situation where I felt like I was being treated unfairly because I'm a woman. But like I said, I don't want to take away from anyone's experience, and I do think that my work environment is. Um, a bit unique and is a little different from the typical environment. And, and so for me, I've never experienced it, but I, I, I would be very surprised if it was a myth. Okay. Okay, now back to my own mommy Mami, um, from the corporate in-house perspective, what are some of the challenges that female lawyers, I mean, you can combine what you face as against things that you've heard from few of your friends who also work in-house? To the general public, what are some of the problems that um, you okay. encounter? Um, so Kelly made a really good point, and I don't know if my language here is correct, but in terms of misogyny, it doesn't only come from men, it comes from women as well. And that's definitely something that I, I believe a lot of my colleagues have experienced. And you know, um, even outside of the legal department alone. I, especially in the, in, in the industry that we work in, being energy, um, I know that a lot of the females, for instance, feel like subconsciously, it's, it's not, there's, there's no sort of um, malice behind it or whatever, but they just don't ask them to do certain things because they just believe that the women shouldn't be doing them. And, and the, the interesting thing is sometimes I even think it comes from the point of view where the people believe they're trying to help them. So, oh, you know, um, we're not gonna send her into the field because there's a lot of walking or we wouldn't send her to this country because you know, she has kids or because she's married or we don't want her to do this particular thing because, you know, so from their perspective, they believe that they're actually helping. And it's a very, for want of a better word, protective idea, but the harm that does is far worse than, you know, whatever protection they're trying to afford the female person. So again, from an in-house perspective, I know that sometimes uh, um, female lawyers are kept from certain meetings. Um, and in the experience of some of my friends where there's been, you know, flirtation or sexual advances and stuff like that, um, what happens is if they see that there's a client or a particular person that the organization needs a favor from, who is maybe interested in the female lawyer, they will push the lawyer to that person. They will say that, you know, oh, why don't you go and meet Mr. Soso and so? Because they know that Mr. Soso and so is interested in, in the female lawyer, putting her in harm's way, for, you know, from what I believe. Because if you know that the, the person has certain intentions towards this person, you don't then go and put the, you know, put the person in the lion's mouth. Um, so I know that things like that happen a lot. Um, I always say, you know, coming from the UK and then coming into Ghana, you know, in the UK, a lot of people talk about racism. And then in Ghana, you have people who talk about sexism. But I always say I've experienced more sexism than I have racism in my life. And most of the sexism I experienced actually was in Ghana in various different forms. And I know that that is uh, by and large tied to our cultural system but it can be very tough and there are microaggressions there, there, you know there's subconscious things and that's what makes it even harder because 
they don't understand how this is impacting the growth of your career. They don't understand how, you know, this is making it more difficult to achieve the things that you want to achieve or for, or for someone, you know, when Kelly was talking, I really was like, Kelly, I, I know that a large part of the reason why you potentially haven't had this is because you're a very assertive person. I just, I, I know that the people around you probably know that if they were to react to you in a certain way, you would call them out. But then what happens to the, young law, the, the younger lawyers who can't do that, who can't stand up for themselves, who can't speak up for themselves, um, does that mean that they get left behind? Um, and so there's a whole, you know, bigger issue here when it comes to the challenges that female lawyers face, whether it's in-house, whether it's in private practice, um, you know, and even, I'm sure, just to go back to litigation, I'm sure when you, we started the whole legal framework started in Ghana, there probably weren't that many female lawyers. And so it wasn't steered towards women. You know, women at the time probably were at home looking after the kids. So nobody thought of, you know, working hours. Nobody thought of new mothers. Nobody thought of mothers with multiple children when they, they were looking into the whole court system. And that's why, as Kelly mentioned, so many women fall off. It's not necessarily because they don't like litigation, but when you get to a certain point in your life, when you have kids and you have other responsibilities, it just doesn't work. It doesn't fit into your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Okay, mommy, thank you. Um, I've had a lot of... Um these challenges, and I, I didn't hear anything about finances. I'm sure all, most of the field, everyone here is sorted. So I'm very sure I'll be coming for some, some, some financial assistance from all the lawyers. That's how we stand in. Uh, this program is sponsored by two sponsors. Um, Enos Travel is a travel and tour agency currently located at one airport square, eight, eight floor. Um, I'm sure Enos Travel is here. They will give us a brief um, promo on what they are doing. It's also sponsored by Jibo Kinte. Uh, very soon, she'll also be displaying her items. And then um, currently, too, we've been acknowledged by Kemathi and partners who think, uh, they think that uh, the program we are doing is, is quite a remarkable one and that we should continue doing it. So Kemathi and partners, we thank you very much for the acknowledgement and we'll continue to do our best. So Enos Travel, please take over and then tell us about what you do. Taking you to the world and beyond is actually what we do. And uh, Enos Travel has been in assistance for more than five years. And we, um, the directors personally, have been getting other experience traveling to all the other countries, going through the embassies, so um, the basic service that we provide is visa consultation. So every other country that you have interest in, you would uh, come into our office on the eighth floor at One Airport Square Airport City, very close to Marina Mall, and then we'll be very happy to assist you. Our services also include assisting students to study abroad. So if you want to study in the UK, law in the UK, just like Mami Akia and uh, Kelly, you can come to our offices and we'd be very glad to assist you get admission to any of the universities that you want. Um, we also have um, student exchange programs where if you're a student in Ghana, you can do an exchange program for three months in the United States called Work and Travel, where you can um, have work to do and also um, have to get to know other people from that country because that's a place where all the other students from outside the United States come to meet and exchange culture, knowledge, and um, experience as well. As I said, we are located on the eighth floor at One Airport Square. Come into the office and we'll be very happy to assist you with all your traveling issues. Thank you very much, Lois Dari. And, uh, see you guys. All right, thank you very much, Dennis. Um, I think we have 15 more minutes, so we'll wrap up on um, whether law affects the circles of women in terms of their social life, friends, 
we'll also talk a bit about family family life and then those people who are married with kids how they juggle between family life and then law and uh, we'll talk briefly about affirmative action whether is the way forward in ensuring that majority of the women now get a chance to practice and then we'll also look at the way forward so um who do i start from kelly i understand you are very assertive so let me start from you <laughs> So Kelly, is it true that law, law, law affects the social life in terms of your friends, your circles, among other things? Um, I actually have very flexible hours, so I'm also not really the person to ask, but I mean, judging from some of my other friends who are bigger firms, I'll say yes, but um, my chambers is very flexible. So long as you get your work done, you can more or less... You can even leave as early as 3.30 if you have quite work done. Um, we get in about seven. So that that bit, the seven bit is not negotiable. But um, this week alone, I've left at 8.30. I've left at 3.30. Um, so it's, it, it's really, for me personally, it hasn't really affected my social life. Um, and did you want me to answer the affirmative action bit? Or was that for later? Sorry, I can't hear you anymore. You're on mute. Oh, sorry. So for, for those people that the law affects the circle, what do you think is the way forward? Is it a, a system, is it, is it a structural system where I know some firms have some strict adherence coming at this time, leave at that time. I know people who work in the law firm that even if you leave at 7 p.m., you are seen as not serious because they, 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 they had this idea that most of their major clients come to the firm when they have closed, maybe 7, 8 p.m. and stuff. So is it, a, is, it, is it a systematic problem? Is it a structural problem or what? So I, I did intern as a few places earlier on. And honestly, I thought a lot of it was busy work um, I, I think a lot of people um, were kind of afraid to leave because they didn't want to be the first one hours and everyone was racing to be in to be the first one there and there were like a good two three hours in the middle of the day where no one was really doing much and um, for me I'd rather go in do as much work as I need to and leave and when I leave I could be going to dinner with a friend. Um, like tonight, I'm about to play rock band with some friends. Um, I just, I, I just, for me, I don't think we should be seen to be working. I, just I, also, work. I also don't play with my Friday night, so <laughs> right from here, I'm stepping out. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just think that um, I, I wish some places would have better um, environments, workplace environments or cultures where you don't, so long as you do what you're supposed to do, then I just don't think that you have to hang around. I mean, unless you want to stay because there's traffic or something and it's easier to drive home after seven, then that's fine. But um, yeah, for me, just do what you have to do and leave. Rosebud, any contribution on this? How do we juggle between um, keeping our close friends as female, our boyfriends, our fiancés? Because I, I know most of my friends who are dating lawyers had that problem that anytime you call her, she'll tell you I'm at work, busy, let me call you later. In the evening, I'm tired. So it gets to affect communication and not all people can take it. So to your younger sisters, to your people, a female lawyers, what was the advice for them? Well, before we get to that, I, I think that... I know, I know the Jonathan Aluas and then the Ewans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, shout out to Jonathan and Eubank. Um, I think that, you know, there is a structural issue that needs to be discussed, um, especially for just women in general, not just women in law, but, you know, women that are working in formal sectors. Um, is I think that you know if if the world and this is an ideal probably an idealistic view but if the world was structured in a way such that you know things could be flexible then as Kelly has said maybe 
hair work, the way hair work is set up could be the way all of us, our work will be set up so that you are, you are, um, your work is, your output is measured based on what you actually do and are able to complete versus how many hours you are sitting in the office. And if we are all supposed to sit in the office till 10 p.m. to prove that we're actually working, then what happens if you have a child? What happens if you have you know, a side gig? What happens if you just have your family you want to hang out with or you just want to go home and sleep? What happens to that? You know, we have to be forced to stay in the office and sort of keep up with some sort of idea that we're working. And I think that in a, especially in a situation where now let me just use a special um, a special um, example. Let's see if you were married or if you had a child, right? Especially if you had a child, most likely as a mother, I mean, unless you're, you know, your situation is very different, most likely you would be the one who would be the primary caregiver of your child. And so in that scenario, you you are the one that will have to be taking time off work or closing early to make sure you're home, take care of your child and all of that. So I think that even as we sort of grow into um, our careers and as we become future employers one day or future bosses or CEOs, we also have to look at how we can create a system where um, the women that work with us are sort of empowered to be able to do their work and do it well within the sort of constraints that we have as women you know because I think that sometimes it becomes an issue if if you you made an example about the work being given to maybe men or you know work male colleagues I personally haven't really had that issue because like I said the the firms that I've worked that have been female dominated so I haven't really had that however I know a lot of people who have experienced that but that's also because for instance if you had to choose between someone who had a two-year-old and a man who had a two-year-old you would choose a man because and then a father with a two-year-old is basically a single man with no child you know I mean <laughs> that's just really what it is he's not going to tell you I can't come for this networking event because I have to go and go and take care of my child he's not going to tell you that my child is sick and so I have to take time off and go and take my child for vaccinations or I have to do this or I'm pregnant or I'm this you don't have those things and so I think that if if we if if we are able to sort of within ourselves and in our little corners make sort of some adjustment and we begin to see women as access to the team and not liabilities then I think that it will it will it will help you know all of us mm. but yeah I don't know if I answered your question but that was oh, yeah, 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 based yeah, on, yeah, <laughs> on yeah, what yeah, Kelly, yeah, Kelly yeah, had said. so many revelations which is, 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 is a good can I just make one more point Right. You said something about finances, and I think that's also something that's really important. Oh, to from mention. your from all your 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 contributions, I, I didn't hear anything about finance. I know Kelly is fine, Mama is fine, <laughs> Rosebud is fine, and well, I think Rosebud is making a really important point. We should discuss. We only have six minutes left, and I think we should have an honest discussion about about finances. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know the the, the female lawyers are fine. I mean, are yeah. we? <laughs> you know i work with i work with two female lawyers um Mamekia and then address i know financially they are good so from my perspective i know they are good oh wow okay. i don't know about this for what <laughs> I <do. laughs> and since Mamekia is not making any um, yeah she's not interjecting at any point so i mean she really isn't you know i'll come for <laughs> some tips on that from her later. all right so Rosebud, let's hear let's hear your contribution yeah, so quickly, I was just also going to say that just something that we need to think about, you know, I have found something that I've personally found is that where I, I see, let's say, two people, we all graduate law school, the same year, we all coming to FM, the same year, all of that, right? One is, let's say, a man, let's say, married with two kids or three kids. One is a single lady. There has sometimes been this idea that as a man, because you are the provider and the one that is being looked at to, you know, take care of your family. I have found instances where um, certain um, privileges have been extended, not necessarily based on merit, but just based on gender. Because in the idea, the idea of the, the employer is that, oh, you are a woman, what are you using your money for? Even if you have money, another man will come and be spreading you and you don't really need it. 
you don't have a child, you are not married, you don't need the money. Whereas this is somebody with two, three kids, Charlie, but this is where I will interject and say, you are so right. (laughs) (laughs) When they give you the money, you'll be traveling and doing all sorts of frivolous things with it, please. Meanwhile, somebody's wife is squeezing them for school fees. So we need to make these adjustments. And I think that, you know, it's, it, 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 I mean, if someone truly deserves it on merit, that's fine. Nobody's going to argue with that. But I've found that a lot of times, you know, just based on the fact that, you know, the man, he needs the money more than you. You see that certain decisions, certain people are promoted ahead of you, certain people are given all sorts of benefits and women are still left behind. And then on top of that, um, pay gap then you also have the other issues that you have to deal with the, you know social harassment now if you have kids it's an issue so I think that you know just for us just something for us to think about there's so much that we can do and so many things that we can fight for when it comes to you know just the women in that we work with and we ourselves even as, as women in, in, in the legal um, journey so yeah sorry for that long rant but yeah I had oh, to it's be- fine it's fine um mommy okay Yes. Any, any, any contribution on this, this angle of our discussion? Yes, yes. Very good. There's, there's so many that I have to say, but I have like, I'll use one minute to try and say everything that I want to say, but I strongly, strongly agree with what um, Rosebud just said. She laid it out so correctly. It's happened to me at every single stage of my career, every single stage of my career where um, I've been passed up or um people haven't felt like I should get the cut of the pie that I need to get because I'm a woman or because I'm going to use the money to buy shoes or because I'm going to use the money to buy you know whatever other things they deem not fit women are just not considered to be providers so you know I remember there was a firm that I was working for that was actually um It was led by a woman and she was fairly young. And I believe this was quite a while ago. And I believe at the time, the cut that she was supposed to make was something like 200,000 cities. Um, That was what she earned. And the interesting thing was, um, there was somebody behind the scenes basically. And the person made that comment. He he was like, but this young girl, what's she going to do do with all this plenty money? She's too greedy. That doesn't matter. She did the work, she earned it. It doesn't matter whether, what she, even if she's going to throw it up in the air, she earned it. So, she, you know, but had it been a man, no, nobody would have asked that question. So, like I said, I've experienced, experienced and continue to experience sexism um, every day in, in the work that we do. Um, I know that the legal profession is no exception. So that is just a warning out there for young female lawyers coming into it. I would advise you to do a lot of reading, um, to own your narrative, to have answers, to be informed, because you will need to fight for yourself. Um, yeah. Um, on the way forward, Kelly, I mentioned affirmative action and you wanted to make a contribution. Do you think that affirmative action is the way forward or um, there may be other ways which uh, all these challenges that you, you, you've explained can be, um, uh, can be resolved as well? Um, I actually didn't necessarily want to make a comment on it because um, I haven't thought that much about affirmative action. And if we're talking about it in terms of entry into the profession, I might be wrong, but I think in Ghana, more women are called to the bar than men these days. Um, So I'm not sure if we have an issue there. I don't know in terms of retention, how many women stay in. And then in terms of maybe at the bar itself, as as in, in litigation, I don't know what steps could be taken to encourage women to to stay in it because um, honestly, nothing changes in Ghana. Let me put it that way. Wait, are we still on? Yes, we are on. We are on. Oh, okay. It's just a display of our social media handles. So oh, okay, okay. You can, you, um, can, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. So yes, after yes. every session, we up- upload the videos there for the people who are not able to. Okay, uh, okay, okay. So these, these are social media handles for you. Too. Okay. So um, so, I guess what I was saying was that um, in terms of how we would get, encourage more women maybe to stay into in litigation, um, I just 
can't really see how it's going to change, at least not at the institutional level, because um, I just, the, the legal system to even change anything from maybe saying we should file documents one way instead of another, it, it just won't even work. It's, it's almost like you're fighting against the strongest tide. Um, they're trying to change the system to a digital system, e-justice. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but um, they've been talking about it ever since I qualified and or even probably before that. And the court staff won't even log the entries into the computer. So I don't know institutionally how anything can change in terms of representation, maybe maybe if we had more female mentors, like I was talking about, um, I do know that a few female-led groups. I think the GBA has like a, a female group, um, a woman at the bar. I don't know if any of any of the speakers are involved in that and what experiences they've had in those groups, but uh, maybe more female mentorship instead of affirmative action would. Um, just help women stay in the, the profession and maybe thrive more. All right, Kelly, uh, thank you very much for the contribution. And also to all our speakers, too, we are grateful for your time. Um, I know there may be some contributions that our listeners may want to also make, whether a question to our speakers or a contribution or a suggestion. If you have any like that, please unmute yourself and then um, ask your question or make your contribution. Nakite, please go ahead. Hello? Um, any other person who wants to make a contribution? Idris, I know you, 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 you you have some contribution you want to make. Let me check the message as well. Um, Hello, Anisma. Yes. yes. I just go ahead. Hi, Anisma. Yes, Idris, do you have a contribution to make or a question? Um. Yes, I was just I was just to ask a question. Um. Thank you for this. Um, talk that you're having, the contributions have been really good so far. I just want to ask, in terms of being a woman in the workplace and being passed over for opportunities because um, your superiors probably feel like you may not be the best option to do the work, even though you might be competent, how would the speaker say you overcome something like that? What, what can you do in terms of that? Um... This is to uh, Rosa Tignat. Yes, can she please say that again? I was slightly distracted. Okay, so her question is that um, in an instance where you know you deserve that opportunity, but mm -hmm. you're always overlooked, how do you go about it as a young female lawyer? Okay, so I mean, I will give my response which is my personal of course just you know based on my personality so I won't I don't want to necessarily recommend it if you know just be sure that you it aligns with your own values before you you go ahead um for me I have found that in these scenarios I prefer to handle things head on you know if there is a spe specific situation like this which I know and I and I am not just it's not rumors or sort of whispers but i know for a fact that something like this is happening i will definitely speak to somebody in charge about it um just also know that as you are doing this the way in which it's done is very important and also know that it may or may not go in your favor but i think it's important to always speak up um, I, I had a similar situation a few years ago and I, I really just had to, you know, bring it up with the partners at the time and let them know, listen, I know these are the decisions that have been made. Um, I'm just, can you please let me understand why these decisions were made? Is this something that I have done? Um, you know, I find that this might be the particular situation. In one instance, somebody else had been told 
that, oh, for this person is because they're a man, so, 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 and so. So because I had that, I said, oh, and I was told that this was why it was done because this person is a man and blah, 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 blah. And so I kind of say, say, challenged their, their thoughts. And I mean, we had a whole conversation about it. You know, like, oh, we didn't think about it that way. You know, we didn't think it was a big deal because to them, they don't really see it as taking something from you versus giving something to somebody else who they think they're just trying to help. Um, so I would say, you know, if you have all the facts and if you work with people that are understanding and you have to just really judge because sometimes you can, Charlie, it's not every boss that you can talk to or even ask a question, you know, so you have to be really delicate about it, but always be assertive and make the point. And if you find that after you've made the point one, two, three, four, five times, you're being ignored, it's not working, then you have to make a decision for yourself whether you will stay because maybe the benefits that you are deriving from that place are far outweigh whatever issues that you're having or you walk out and find something else. But yeah, you have to just think of, for me, I'll say at least at least have the conversation first to see where everybody's, to see everybody's position and then you can take, you know, another stand after that stand. Okay, Rosebud, thank you. Um, I, I just want to make a big contribution on that. Um, in the course of the conversation, some comments were made that some of the seniors may think that they are doing you a favor because probably you are married, taking you to maybe sites where you spend about four or five days. In the, it's, it's true. Sometimes what we, I won't say me, what some lawyers may be thinking is that, okay, let me not take my make out of maybe a car to session you or so where it's more brutal where they'll be in the doing community relations for say a week or two crossing rivers crossing um entering into the villages and stuff but the moment you make them know that uh, have a conversation I, this, this 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 is what i really want to do and that don't take me out don't try to shield me because you feel that you are doing me more good. I think that conversation will help because genuinely the person from where he or she may be sitting might be taking or taking other things into consideration before certain decisions are made. And I agree with Rosebud. Once you have that conversation, you let the person understand your 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 ideas about what what the decisions that they made. I, it can go a long way of resolving most of the problems that you may face as well. I don't know whether I address we've answered your question. Uh, Mami, do you have any, any contribution as well? Um, not really. I believe that everything has been said. But one thing that I also picked up along the way um, from a group of young, actually female lawyers that I was on, and I think this should you know, send advice to anybody. It's good to always have these confrontations. It's all. It's good to always um, have these conversations. But the one thing they said, which I've always carried with me, is that before you go and ask for anything, make sure that you're good at your job. It's one thing feeling like you're being prejudiced because you're a woman, but it shouldn't just be because you're a woman, but because you believe you're competent and you're good at your job. So. Before anything else, that is the thing that I would say, that make sure that you are good at what you're doing. You're doing your homework, you're doing your research, you're delivering, you're meeting deadlines, you're doing everything that you have to do. That's the first hurdle to cross. Once you have that in the bag, essentially you have a right to everything equally. Um, that's all I have to say. All right, I think we've exceeded our time by 10 minutes. I don't know whether we can take one more question or contribution. I've seen some senior lawyers joining. Um, lawyer Dina, thank you for joining. And then uh, Lawyer Mifatu, thank you for joining. Um, do we have just, we can take one more one more contribution or question and then we, we close our call. Friday night, we step out. Yes, Mas. Hello, MFA. Please go ahead. Um, mine is just a contribution. I, I really want to say a very big thank you to this wonderful female lawyers. I admire them a lot and um, hope to be someone like them. 
and then are I'm you gonna be okay here, my father, I'm afraid you've been, you've been postponing your dreams of becoming a lawyer. Why? It's been six years now. I don't know what you're waiting for. Soon. Okay. And I, I'm very happy they, they shared their feelings, their thoughts, their experiences, and I've really learned a lot. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, too. All right, so on that note, to end on MFS, um, thank you, message. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Mami Ekria. Thank you, Rosbad. Thank you, uh, Bessie. Uh, and I know that very soon we'll be having more financial um, uh, discussions on how female lawyers can make money like my own address and then Mami Ekria. So thank you for your time. I'm really grateful. And very soon, we'll be, I, mean, I know you're all special, specialists in your areas. Mami on energy law, Kelly on litigation, Bessie still trying to find her feet, and then Rosebud. So we also do one-on-one -on -one discussions on specialized topics. So very soon, Kelly, I'll be coming to your doorstep. Mami, Kriya, I know when it comes to international transactions, dealing with Clifford Chance, White and Case, all the big, big lawyers, which you've done, Rosebud to, uh, and then Bessie. So thank you for your time. Thank you all our listeners. And thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, bye-bye. Bye, bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Hey, everyone.